If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. A Missouri Senate committee is offering up a plan that could have a big impact on entities like Planned Parenthood. It's part of the fallout from a contentious special session earlier this year to renew a critical tax known as the Federal Reimbursement Allowance that helps fund the state's Medicaid program. Senator Bill White of Joplin is in charge of that committee, and he joins us on Politically Speaking to talk about what his fellow Republicans want to do and about the high-profile split in his caucus that could carry on to the 2022 session. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me from Jefferson City, she is St. Louis Public Radio State House reporter Sarah Kellogg. And joining us for the first time ever on Politically Speaking, he is the state senator for Missouri's 32nd District. It's Bill White. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. As I said before we press record, I always uh, love having first time guests on the show. Tell us a little bit about your district, first of all. Well, the district is comprised of three counties, Dade County, Jasper County, and Newton County. Uh, We're in the southwest corner of the state to border uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, and uh, just, uh, you know, one county north of Arkansas. Uh, you know, we have Joplin, a major metropolitan area. Uh, it's 50,000 people with, you know, 20,000, 30,000 bedroom communities, uh, population communities around it. People would say it's, it, we have a lot of rural, of course, a lot of agriculture, but, you know, we have major Fortune 500 businesses here in Joplin also construct, you know, the as plants and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Senator. Like, what's your background before you decided to get into the the wild and wacky world of Missouri politics? Okay. Well, uh, depends on how far back you want to go. Uh, uh, started college, went, went in the Marines for four years, uh, very end of the Vietnam War, uh, went to Japan, uh, got out of the, the service, went back to college, University of Kansas, uh, got my BA there in uh, history. Uh, went to the University of Chicago, got a master's in uh, uh, Soviet area studies, uh, went to work for an electric company up there, Commonwealth Edison, uh, ended up designing software to help build nuclear plants. Uh, did that for about 10 years. Uh, during that time, uh, I always like to learn new things. So I started an e program at John Marshall Law School they have for professionals and uh, started that. Uh, my wife's a neurosurgeon down here in Joplin, but she, we were, we've been married for a long time, 40 some years. And we were married then, and uh, she graduated her residency program. Uh, I didn't start in time to get done with a law degree before she uh, got done with her residency. So I ended up finishing my uh, degree at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, so I did that, uh, did the lawyer thing for a while. I was attorney for the Jasper County Juvenile Office. Uh, did a lot of guarding at Lydon work, uh, abuse, neglect, delinquency, that sort of thing. Uh, that eventually burns you out. Uh, went back to doing more contracts and HIPAA type things like that. Uh, then uh, started doing some uh, just volunteer teaching for fun at uh, our Lutheran school and our uh, Catholic high school, uh, doing government, things like that, uh, while still d- doing a, a law practice also. Uh, decided, got into politics because it was a, uh, when we uh, came, well, it was the 2010 race and decided that, you know, I didn't, the person that was running as a Republican, I was decided I just didn't want to have represent me, uh, maybe a little more uh, liberal than I was a trial attorney. And uh, so it was kind of just uh, the point of whether you you put up or shut up, (laughs) you know, uh, there wasn't a, people weren't getting the race. So I decided to go ahead and get in the race. You know, that was my, uh, 
entry into, into politics and you know, uh, was in the House for eight years, uh, ran for the Senate, uh, won that. Uh, and so I've been in the Senate for three years. So this is a big question that I have to ask you, Senator. Are you a Chicago Bears fan? Uh, so, so, shall we say. <laughs> I lived in Chicago for about 10 years. Uh, I quit following all professional sports when they went on strike. As, as each sport went on strike, they moved off my list. So I, I haven't watched a Bears game or a Chiefs game or anything like that in many, many years. So here's the reason I asked that question. Um, your one of your predecessors in the Missouri Senate, uh, Senator Gary Nodler, is probably the biggest Chicago Bears fan in the state of Missouri. And uh, I, 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 I'm Facebook friends with him, even though he's been out of politics since 2010. We still talk about the Bears almost on a weekly basis. Well, you know, uh, don't don't follow most professional sports anymore. Oh, so I'm going to turn it over to Sarah because she has been covering a committee that you have been involved in. It's known as the Interim Committee on Medicaid Accountability and Taxpayer Protection that kind of spiraled out of this special session dealing with the federal reimbursement allowance. So, Sarah, I'm going to shut up now. You take over the questioning. Well, and hello again, Senator. Uh, I think we're going to have some similar questions that I asked uh, last time we spoke, but I think I think it'll be good to get into and have our listeners um, kind of know what's going on. So kind of what is the purpose of this committee? You know, why was it initially established? You know, what were some of its goals? If you can give me kind of some of the background. Okay. Well, the committee is actually a twofold committee the way I've got it organized. Uh, the first part did come out of the end of the regular session, the special session uh, dealing with the FRA, uh, dealing with the funding of affiliated agencies with uh, that provide abortions. Uh, that, that was one of the main focuses, but the task we got uh, for the committee is to ensure that we're spending state dollars wisely, appropriately, and in line with our statutes and the, the values of the state of Missouri. So uh, the first part, which we just released a report on, dealt with the uh, abortion facilities, uh, family planning affiliated with abortion facilities, uh, made suggestions, recommendations uh, in that report. The second half of the committee is going to be looking at transparency, and the overall efficacy of how we do our Medicaid system, that's the quality and the quantity of what we're doing. Uh, it's a, the second half is gonna be a very 30,000 foot level because it's a huge system and we're just barely starting to scratch the surface of the, the concept of transparency. There's a lot of questions I've asked uh, the department, uh, MoHealthNet, and haven't gotten answers for, or that you know they're still working on getting me answers for, but that I think should be a little bit more apparent. We, we want to have a better feel for how we're spending money and ensuring that we're getting the best bang for the buck, if you will. That's probably the best way to put it. Uh, my goal, my own personal goal is not, I don't want us, isn't a reduction in the amount of money that we spend. It's the ensuring we get the best quality and the most service for the money we spend. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what the outcome of this committee was ultimately, you know, what were the recommendations the committee came up with in this report? You know, what's new on possibly a statutory basis? Okay, well, the, the recommendations that we have several uh, out there, one is for a, a new statute uh, that would add in to allow us to consider uh, the licensure or impact of a, prob a removal of licensure of events in other states. If they were to happen in the state of Missouri, if they would have happened in the state of Missouri, and would it be against our statutes, then we are able, the statute would allow them to, us to take that into consideration uh, in the, the granting of a license or the, the scope of the license. So it, it allows us to basically take care of, to take into account in the totality of what we're doing, uh, events from a, an affiliated organization out of state, if you will. And so that, that's the statutory requirement. The other things we uh, recommended that the executive branch uh, tighten up, uh, extend, expand uh, their criteria on uh, clinics uh, to ensure the you know, proper health safety, uh, that all the requirements, the things that we want uh, that are in our statutes are, that are intended to be you know, scrutinized are scrutinized properly. One of them is uh, for the family planning component. Uh, we have a requirement in statute that if they're going to be making a referral to an out-of-state abortion clinic, they have to provide literature uh, for that and you know explanation if you know what's 
requested. And it isn't clear in our statutes that that can be grounds for uh, a restriction or removal of licensure. So we were, we're going to want that to be in rules and uh, may well put that in statute also to make it very clear because it's statutory based course that you know if, if they're not following our statutes that is grounds for uh, being removed as being a Medicare provider, Medicaid, sorry. Yeah, and with you know the out of state you know possible statute, the thing that's going to be you know addressed in the upcoming legislature, I guess kind of what where did you get that inspiration? Kind of how did you come up with this statutory um, requirement that or this ability to assess the performance in other states and its impact on uh, Missouri's youth, like Missouri's ability to possibly remove a family planning service off of Medicaid if it is a violation in a different state? What made you come up with that? Well, actually, it, it was uh, started, I believe, back in 2016. I don't recall the senator, but it was uh, proposed back then, discussed. I'm not sure it ever made it to a statute or the floor, uh, but that, it's been one of the things I'm aware of that was out there. The, the issue we're dealing with with affiliated agencies, and some people are, think that's a little tenuous, but when, you, when you're affiliated with an agency, you know, what, is the, what is the level of control? and the level of oversight that they have in their oversight of these affiliated organizations. Uh, that, that's one of the key things that deals with these family planning clinics. They are in our state separate, L Planned Parenthood's the example. It isn't just against a Planned Parenthood, but it would be any uh, clinics fitting into this category. Uh, but if you're running people's, if you're identifying, you're using their logos, their staff has influence on what you're doing, that's the whole connection, that it's setting policy. And that policy, we, we have very clear in our statutes in the state of Missouri that the state has a, a critical interest in protecting uh, the lives of our Missouri citizens, including the unborn. That's very clear in many sections of our statute. And therefore, we want to ensure that the people we're licensing are following our statutes. When, when you have an affiliated agency, when you have an affiliated entity in another state uh, that has influence over our state, uh, we definitely... I think we have a, a valid interest in looking at what that state's done and then taking that into consideration in the, their affiliated, if in their own or their affiliated agencies' uh, participation in our Medicaid program in our state. And you know, what are you, you know, what do you believe are the odds for the statutory change, you know, making it through the legislature? Kind of what is the plan for this possible change? You know, it will be filed as a bill, I'm not sure by who, either myself or uh, my vice chair, probably Carl Essing, or one of us will, will file it. Uh, it will possibly be a part of another, you know, be added on to another bill. It's a very small, you know, lengthwise, it's not a very big, it's like a paragraph uh, or so. So often short, short, small bills end up getting merged into a little bit bigger bill that comes out of our committees. But uh, I think that it will pass the legislature. Yes. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. It'll be contested, of course, on the floor, uh, but I, I ultimately see, think it will pass. Do you have any concerns that the proposal you just described will put Missouri's Medicaid funding at risk from the federal government? Uh, no, not at all. I don't think anything in our report does. We are allowed by the federal government to set our own criteria uh, that are based on quality of service. And the things we put in rule-wise are, are that way. You know, are the rules we requested and this, the statute that I just uh, discussed is definitely a quality of service issue. So I, I don't see that it, it, it in any way puts our federal uh, funding in jeopardy. Uh, you know, part of the family planning issue that we had with the FR when we were doing this special session on FRA is that the, the federal rules are very clear that you have a, an annual and provider concept in the uh, family planning that you get to go to where you want to go to. Uh, but even then, th those family planning clinics still have to meet the criteria we put out in the state uh, to ensure they're doing appropriate quality. And again, it's not an, uh, allowing us to consider what affiliates do. It isn't a hard, fast, you know, you're kicked out in the state of, you know, Oklahoma, that you get kicked out in the state of Missouri. But it's, it allows our department to consider uh, actions of affiliated entities in other states as part of, you know, the overall analysis of whether they, uh, are appropriately you know, meeting our statutory requirements. Let's just say that this bill ends up leading to the St. Louis Planned Parenthood Clinic shutting down. 
wouldn't people that want abortions just go to other states with more robust access to abortion, like Illinois or even Kansas, which I think has three or four abortion clinics? It would remove, and, and not just the St. Louis clinic, any other clinic that comes into being. Uh, we cannot control what Kansas and Illinois do, unfortunately. Uh, our statutes are very clear. I am a very pro-life person. Not most of our I, Republicans aren't. I think we have a few Democrats that are somewhat pro-life. They may not always vote that way, but I, I think they have very strong pro-life sentiments uh, uh, that we, we can control the legislation of what happens in our state. Uh, and that, that's all we can do in the state of Missouri. Uh, we currently don't, we, of course, we haven't paid for uh, federal and state law uh, doing our uh, abortions and Medicaid that are not for the protecting the life of mother type of scenario in the, in the state. Uh, there already are referrals uh, going out of state. That's why part of one of the things I was responsible for putting in there is to ensure that the family planning clinics that are making referrals out of state are following exactly our guidelines. And if they're not following our statutes, then they that will be considered in their ability to continue to you know, see be funded by uh, our Mo Health Net system. You know, my next question regarding this is, you know, though the rules that the committee offered and the statutory uh, changes that the committee, you know, recommends don't mention Planned Parenthood by name. You know, they currently are the only abortion provider, you know, with Medicaid support in the state. So do you think the language in the rules that you have proposed is strong enough to combat the circumstances that the state is facing where you say, well, we're not focusing on Planned Parenthood, but th that's technically what you are doing because right now they are the only provider in the state. Okay. First of all, uh, we're dealing with this is any clinic that is the same category that uh, will go under the same scrutiny, whether they do abortions or not. If they, if they fall into the category of these clinics, if they fall into the, the plan, if they're doing family planning, they're going to have to do these same things, whether they're a county health department making an out-of-state referral, uh, or, you know, a QF, QFHC, I can't remember, pronounce those very well. The, you know, whoever it is, they're going to have to follow these guidelines. Uh, first, you know, part of the issue we had with the, in the special session, is the Missouri Constitution is very clear that you, we cannot do something that is targeting a specific individual entity with that intent of targeting that individual, specific individual entity. Uh, a category, I mean, we can say, you know, just we could come up with a law saying no self-driving vehicles or something like that. And that isn't going against, if we write the law in such a way that we're only going against a particular car company's self-driving vehicle, uh, can't do that. That's unconstitutional. And that's not court decision. That's how the Constitution's written in black and white. Uh, so that was part of the issue we had with the proposal, the amendment that was, you, you can't say we are going to defund this entity and no other entity. Uh, you know, you could see if we would have taken the approach of defunding all uh, in, in any abortion facility, a clinic meeting certain guidelines, you know, that's, that's a different animal. That isn't what was done. So uh, I think that if they are currently the only abortion provider, it's not exclusive to them. And again, any other clinic that meets the same requirements for scrutiny, it's going to go through it. And I, again, I'm not in the department to know if, or what other, if we have clinics that are of the same level uh, that would qualify for the same level of scrutiny that they were, where they're doing enhanced rules for it, it, it will be across the board. It is not targeting, you know, a specific entity, it's targeting a category. Are there any concerns that the general language of the recommendations could put other Medicaid funded providers that aren't related to family planning at risk, or does this just apply to organizations that deal with family planning? Well, it would be any affiliated agencies affiliated with abortion providers. Uh, family planning is the only part that seems to be uh, a, a strong focus, I guess you'd say. Um, I'm just off the top of my head, not coming up with that third level of entity uh, if you're not doing family planning, you're not doing abortions, I'm not quite sure what other entity you'd be putting in between those two. Uh, but if they were in there, if they're an affiliated to an abortion clinic, it would be there. Now, if they're not doing family planning, you know, that, that family planning provides, of course, wouldn't apply to them because they're not doing that. Yeah. When we last spoke, the report with its recommendations, you know, hadn't been signed yet. What is the updated status in this report? Kind of can you can you give us kind of what's what's changed? Uh, basically, it, it changed. We put in the information about the committee we had, <laughs> the hearing. Uh, the the basic, uh, basis of the report is pretty much the same. Uh, we did uh, uh, express that it, it is a, an emergency need. 
it's critical uh, because of our vested interest in the state and uh, protecting life. So we uh, put it in so that it would be requested to be an emergency rule so we don't wait until the whole rule process, normal rule pro making process, sorry. Uh, that, but that's pretty much, it is out there. It's available, it, it was signed. It was signed by all the Republican members. It was not signed by the Democrat members, which was somewhat expected. Uh, and that's also why we did a, a two part, uh, our committee's doing a second report then on the other half of what we're looking at for transparency and efficacy in our Medicaid system. Because uh, there's more bipartisan interest in ensuring we're getting the best bang for the buck, if you will, in our Medicaid system. We're providing the most and best care we can. So I would anticipate that being a much more, uh, if, if there are not signatures, I'm not sure, I don't think it's going to be just one party or the other. It would be individuals. And so, uh, but that it is out there, it's available to, to be seen. Uh, actually, the department, uh, one of them, I'm off the top of my head, I think it's the Division of uh, Health and Senior Services. One of the two departments has already filed emergency rules that had a little bit of a glitch. They didn't fill out the paperwork, right? So uh, that's being refiled. Bureaucracy is wonderful. <laughs> we'll be right back after this quick break with State Senator Bill White. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. And we're back on Politically Speaking with our special guest, Senator Bill White. He is a Republican from Joplin. I want to move on to your more general view of the Missouri Senate right now. You're part of Senate leadership as the assistant majority leader. And it seems from my faraway perch in St. Louis, and I think Sarah saw this in Jefferson City, that there's elements of like the Republican caucus that seem to be under constant attack from the quote unquote conservative caucus. I'm putting them in quotes because I guess the membership kind of changes depending on what day it is. What's your view on this whole split in the Republican caucus? And how do you think it's going to affect what you're able to accomplish in 2022? Well, having this uh, sub caucus is nothing new. It's been there since I was in the Senate uh, for the last three years. And actually, when I was in the House, I think it was uh, formed. It wasn't quite as uh, vocal or as uh, pronounced uh, in activity. Uh, anytime you have a supermajority, uh, you're going to have different factors. We have so many uh, people, right, Republicans right now. I mean, there's going to be groups within the party when the Democrats were in charge, you know, back in the 90s. I'm sure they had their own separate groups inside, some that were more liberal, some that were more conservative. And uh, the use of the word conservative uh, is what they picked. I won't necessarily say not, not everything I think they support I would consider conservative, but that's, you know, that's the name of their caucus. Uh, you know, I work with individuals, and if the if some people want to band together and have a caucus a, alignment in, within our own caucus, uh, I would hope that each one of the members of that caucus or any other group. I mean, we have you know sportsmen's caucus that are a little different oriented, uh, lots of other different caucuses like that. Uh, that they're making decisions based on what they consider to be best for the state of Missouri and their constituents and what they believe in. Uh, and I I would trust. I mean, I do not. I don't vote for something just because the Republicans vote for something. I look at it as an individual. Uh, I represent the, my constituents. I represent the state of Missouri. And it's my job to represent them and also to do what I consider to be best for the state of Missouri. And if, if there are people who are just going to go with, if they've had an allegiance that they're going to vote regardless of whether they personally agree with or not, that's, that's their business and out of my control. Uh, there's always going to be subgroups. Uh, my first day in the uh, legislature, we had uh, two people that I actually like pretty well, but uh, the very first day, they, they, I think, intentionally sat on the opposite ends of the back row and for six hours or so uh, held the floor on before we even got done with the preliminaries of, you know, introducing guests and all that stuff uh, because they were unhappy about something that happened uh, the session before. So, you know, that there, there's nothing new with the that type of thing going on in the Senate where it's a different body than the House. Uh, we cannot, we don't have 20 minutes and have to sit down and be quiet uh, so we can talk. 
And that's part of the uniqueness of the Senate. That's why the Senate uh, is, we're, we always like to pride ourselves we're the more deliberative body uh, we need to be. We have the, we have, because we have the ability to slow things down, we have the ability to not pass a bill. Uh, any senator has that ability to kill a bill unless we're really willing to go to the mat to do a previous question, which we just do very, very rarely. And in my opinion, should be used very rarely in the Senate. We're, we're much more geared on a uh, consensus building negotiating basis in the Senate. And that's when I have a, a significant bill, tort bills, which I can have a couple this year coming up combined into one. Before that ever gets the floor, I will have talked to each and every Senator, explained it, gone through, taken their questions. Uh, you have to do more work. In the House, you know, you can get up and complain about something for 15, 20 minutes, and then you have to sit down and shut up and that's the way it goes. Uh, we can filibuster. So, you know, you have to convince people in the Senate that what you want to do is right. And uh, whether the people band together in groups or not, that's their own choice. Looking ahead to January, uh, there's a lot of things that the legislature is going to have to, to, to check off a list, you know, and so do you think that, you know, how do you think that this tension is going to affect the Missouri Senate's ability to do major things next session, you know, including appropriating federal, uh, including appropriating federal funds for Medicaid expansion, just appropriating funds from the American Rescue Plan, you know, getting a congressional map done, you know, how, how are you going to accomplish all that? The way we've always done, you know, they, they, they didn't just appear this year at the end of, of the session. Uh, we've, we've had pretty much, well, especially the last uh, whole year, but we, we've had the same people there. Uh, we'll just work through it. I mean, you know, we we need to get redistricting. We need to get it done. Uh, and we, you know, we're only doing the U.S. congressional redistricting. The the other redistricting it, the legislature has nothing to do with. Uh, I don't anticipate that being too serious a problem. I mean, we're going to have, it's going, the, the basic shapes of the districts aren't going to change that much. I, I, in my own opinion, I don't see it. I mean, we've, we've had our districts for quite a while uh, and how we're going to deal with the population change for our congressional districts we'll we'll deal with and we'll we'll have to work with them uh everybody together uh as far as the, the rest of our agendas go I mean we've got education we've got election reform uh we've got tort bills I mean surprisingly uh my tort bill had some issues with the the, the people that identified themselves as the conservative caucus uh you know if we get through it we pass those bills uh we we will you know work with it you know there's always compromise and the ability in, in if, if you just can't get it through you can't get a bill through sometimes you know bills take four or five years to get through uh now of course things like redistricting uh, we have to do quicker uh but you know there is you 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 don't in the senate in particular you don't get 100 percent of what you want ever uh you you know tax reform i mean my gosh we've been working on tax reform since i was in the house we probably were working on it since the legislature started. Uh, we keep doing tweaks. We do. We finally got the Wayfair tax through. I mean, we we've been working on Wayfair for a long, long time, and we finally got it to a point where we could get enough people to agree to it. And you know, uh, as, as I recall, uh, not everybody. You know, they wanted to go back to that particular caucus. I don't think they all voted for it, even though one of their members was the person carrying that bill. So, it, senators are senators first. They're members of whatever else they want to be second. And that's how I, again, that's how I treat individuals. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I've had some decent success getting some of my bills done is, you know, I talk to individuals, I explain to them, I go through, I, I field their questions or concerns, and you know, we modify things. I, my, I can guarantee my, my punitive damages bill I did two years ago was a vastly different bill than it was when it started. And that is in large part because not of lobbyists, but it's because of senators and what they had concerns on. We took them into consideration, things we were able to work with, some things we just said, no, we can't change that. That's too fundamental to the, to the change we need to institute. And so we, I don't see it going to be any more of a problem than it has been. Uh, we're going, you know, we, we have some procedural things. We'll, we'll discuss at caucus. We had the little thing about the, whether we, as, as a tradition, we do not, uh, my bill's my bill, even in veto session. I totally agree with that. The budget bill, they want to say, is a little different. Uh, we we do the budget differently than the House. We're not the House. Uh, I am going to make a motion at caucus that we actually put into hard rules that the bill the the budget chairman is still the the handler of that bill, and just like I would with my bill, 
if if I had one of my bills that was up there to be a you know that had been vetoed, which last year the governor did veto my veterans bill, and <laughs> I came very close to deciding to try to override that. But we opted not to. We just fixed it this year, made everybody happy. But you know, I'm going to make that, and if I can get enough votes in the caucus, then we'll change the rules to do that, so that it's very clear. I think we have a good shot at getting that into the rules. I, I do want to ask about the, the the appropriation of the federal money for Medicaid expansion. We're recording this on October 1st, and the Department of Social Services presumably is actually accepting applicants in that expansion pool into the program. So at this point, it's not really Medicaid expansion ap- aspirational anymore. It is It is happening as we're recording this. Um, but the governor told me that the legislature still has to pass a supplemental bill that, first of all, allows his administration to s- spend the federal money that's going to be coming in for the 90-10 match. And at this point, like, I, I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. But there's probably going to be a lot of people that hate Medicaid expansion that are going to try to die on this hill and try not to appropriate that money. What's your expectations about that? Personally, I mean, you know, the, the courts have made their ruling. Uh, we have to, and, and the governor's right. I mean, for the, the executive branch to spend money, we have to authorize it. That's what appropriations do. It's not in the last appropriation, so it's going to have to be a supplemental appropriation. And we will appropriate not only the federal money, but we're going to have to appropriate our part of the match also. So um, I don't know what them, that number is. I haven't talked to Dan Hageman or Lincoln Huff or any of those people lately to you know, see what their number we're going to be throwing out is for that supplemental budget, but we're going to have to pay for it. I mean, we've got court rulings on it, and you know, I'm sure we will have probably some longer discussions on the floor about how bad this is. And the the issue is not how bad it is or not, uh, whether you agree with it or not. Now it has been interpreted. I I totally disagree with the Supreme Court's ruling. Uh, the idea that we're going to somehow change an expenditure of money and the appropriateability and say somehow that the initiative petition was totally fine for not allocating money. When I, I, again, I'm an attorney, I read that constitution. I think the Supreme Court was out there in the left field and inappropriate decision, absolutely. But it's the decision that's out there right now. So we're going to have to live with it. And ultimately we will, we will have to do the appropriation. We may have long drawn out voicing on the floor of how we don't like it, but you know, we're gonna kind of be stuck with it. Uh, part of this whole thing that started with the dealing, going back to the FRA is our, our Medicaid system, first of all, is pro life. I mean, people don't, I, I made this point a lot in, in this argument. You know, who, right now, before we do the expansion, before actually people are getting, that are signing up now on the expansion, our, our original Medicaid we have does pregnant women, children, disabled individuals, and seniors, most of which who are in nursing homes. That's all, th- that, those are four topics to me that are very pro-life. And people to try to somehow say that our, the basis of Medicaid is, is not a pro-life type thing, I think it's a problem. I think that's, that's a wrong thing to try to characterize this as not being a pro-life issue. Now the expansion issue, uh, again, you are putting people on who have the ability to make, in- who, who can work, who are not women, children, disabled or seniors in nursing homes. I mean, the, they're, we're dealing with a level that they can't make enough money to afford insurance. So it's a different pool we're putting in there. And so the arguments and the discussion is going to be a little different uh, as to what we're going to be providing. But I, I think the, the fundamental idea of Medicaid that we have is helping people that, you know, that just didn't have insurance that need healthcare. Now this has expanded into a population that people are concerned about. Uh, we, I am uh, chairman of the, what is it called? Uh, seniors, families, veterans, and military affairs. Two committees got put together. Uh, we deal with a lot of people in a lot of scenarios. We do a, a lot of constituent services where people work, but they don't, you know, if you're making minimum wage, eh, it's very difficult to afford insurance. And I appreciate that. Uh, I've, in my own personal history, uh, I always made sure my family had insurance. Whatever the case was, I, that was a priority I had over anything else. Uh, so it was, but it, it's hard sometimes to do that. I appreciate, uh, we've got the scenario now where we are expanding, whether we like it or not, the, the courts have upheld that constitutional, you know, the initial petition changed the constitution. Uh, so we're going to, we are going to deal with it, how we spend the money. I mean, 
it's going to be an issue of, you know, we only have so much money. Even with federal, we don't, we're only going to have so much money. And we're going to have to look. I want part of my voting is going to be I want to make sure we do not reduce the services of the people who are on the original Medicaid. If you are women, pregnant women, and uh, that includes that year after for mental health stuff. I think that's a very, very important piece that we've got out there. Uh, you know, children, disabled and seniors. I don't, I am going to be very strong in ensuring we do not detriment the, uh, the services available to those people to add services for this new population we're putting in. Uh, the, the people in the original population don't, plain simply don't have the ability to help themselves. There's the argument is how much of the ability to, does this new population coming in have to help themselves? So I am going to be very protective in my voting of, the, of what we currently do for the original Medicaid population. And so some of my votes may look a little contradictory. It depends on what comes out with how that is, but I am going to be very resistant to any, any detrimental, any, any decrease in funding or programs or what's covered for that original Medicaid population. Well, Senator, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, politically speaking, it's a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri St. Louis. You can find all of our stories at stlpr.org. You can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. How can people follow you on Twitter, Sarah? They can follow me at Sarah K. Kellogg. And Senator, I don't believe that you're on Twitter and you've made a great decision about that, by the way. But how could people contact you if they are interested in getting in touch? Well, uh, our, our website's out there. Uh, of course, our, our Senate website uh, it has our, our phone numbers, my cell numbers out there and our email. It's bill.white at senate.mo.gov. Uh, email, phone calls. Uh, but, you yeah, know, I... I have never done the Twitter thing. Uh, it just, I look at, so I, have, I have a Facebook account. <laughs> uh, I look a little bit of Instagram because somehow I got on that. Uh, but uh, no, we, I, I guess I'm old fashioned. I like email and phone calls. We'll be back next time. And until then, so long. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking.